I'm going to ask, please, if uh, Professor Manuel de Jesus Hernandez and <coughs> El Homenajeado Luis Valdez, if they can come forward and sit at the main table, please. Maestro. This is the last table we're going to have. And I would like just to make an announcement that Luis Valdez will be signing his books at the end of the presentation out there at the lobby. Uh, I want to introduce to you a man that is a scholar in Chicano literature, Chicano theater, Dr. Manuel de Jesus Hernandez. Ah! I met him long, long time ago. He's been my teacher, my scholar, my friend, and it is a privilege to have him here tonight. He's going to speak about the lineage, the heritage that Luis Valdez is leaving for all the Chicanos. So please help me welcome El Doctor Manuel de Jesus Hernandez. Well, um, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. I have always been following uh, Luis Valdez ever since the Denver Youth Conference uh, in 1969 when they showed a little section of Suit Suit on film. And then, of, of course, I, I, I read his plays and then I, I've, I've written some essays. And uh, he knows my brother in law, Kiki. Okay. <laughs> And I was also at the uh, premiere of Suit Suit down, down, besides seeing the plays, the, uh, his other plays, at other places, I was at Suit Suit, and it was sold out. And I've seen it also in Mexico City, sold out. And right here in, in ASU, it's been sold out. Yeah. <laughs> and also when, uh, of course, at that time, I was a search for identity of my own. Uh, he influenced me. Uh, two of my sons are, have Mayan names. I didn't chose Aztec, I chose Maya. Uh, one of them is named Chel. Uh, the God of Medicine, and the other one is called Tuk Tum, the, the God of Eloquence and, and Wealth. Okay, so, okay. so, with that in mind, uh, what I want to sh just share with you is this essay I've been working on, and just briefly, uh, it has to do with Mayan and Yaqui mythology. Uh, the title of it is Mayan and Yaqui mythology in Heart of, a, of the Earth, a Popable Story, 1994, by Cherry Moraga and Mama Fight Deer, 2005, by Luis Valdez. A continuing post-colonial mythic counter-discourse and new liberation goals. This, uh, this play is also Mama Fight Deer. It's the most feminist play I've ever read by Luis Valdez. I highly recommend it. A highly document, uh, documented analyze, uh, it's highly doc documented and analyzed in the outstanding study, Bloodline Smith, Indigenism in Chicano, Chicano Literature, 2008, by Chila Marie Contreras. From the early beginnings of contemporary Chicano literature in 1965, there have been present in various and many texts a resonant counter discourse based on indigenous mythology where, as a, decol decol as a decolonizing discursive strategy, the reader returns back in time to indigenous society, parenthesis, Maya and Aztec, Yaqui, parenthesis, from where certain myths and beliefs are adopted and then textually unfolded to highlight specific liberation struggles in today's society that can lead Chicanos and Chicanas into a better future. Such is the case of the long poem, Pensamiento Serpentino, 1973, by Luis Valdez, in the play Dawn, 1974, by Alaurista, Heart of a Line, 1976, by Rodolfo Acuna, Anaya, and Por qué el color chicano es el más bonito, Why the Chicano color is the most beautiful, 1975, by Miguel Mendez. This decolonizing mythic discourse is just present, is still present in current Chicano, Chicana literature, production, literary production is in the place, Heart of the Earth, A Popable Story by Cherry Moraga and Mama Fideer by Luis Valdez. However, now indigenous myths mark and center the marginalization of immigrant, Mayans, Chicanas, and Jackie culture in Mexican, in, in Mexican American society. And based on our interpretation of post-colonial theory, namely the essay, uh, Postcolonial Literatures and Counter Discourse, 1978 by Helen Tiffin, 
Four or Five Worlds, Chicano, Chicana Literary Criticism, a Postcolonial Discourse, 1995 by Rafael Perez Torres, and Mythos, or Mito, Mythos, the Root of Chicano Mythology, 2000 by Jorge Huerta. We reaffirm an inherent subversion in the said, in, in the said continuous Chicano, Chicana mythic counter discourse as an integral strategy of postcolonial thought. Decide an, an, an inevitable, inevitable a said mythic discourse, a hybrid, unmasks and undermines the dominant discourse without seeking to replace it or institute a hegemonic of its own. From the perspective of postcolonial cultures, in this case, Chicanos, Chicanas, hybridity implies the practice of decolonization as a process and not a fixed construction where there exists, one, a dialectical relationship between the highly centered hegemonic system and a distinct, distinct subversion emanating from the periphery, and two, a dialectic between hegemonic and cultural discourses. Uh, parenthesis, class, genre, nation, empire, parenthesis. In postcolonial deconstruction, faced by the center and hegemony itself, the struggle is about achieving equity and equality on the way to building a new society. Regarding the analysis interpretation of the works Heart of, of, of the Earth, A Popable Story, and Mummified Deer, and specifically the myth of the indigenous counter discourse, our objectives are mapping the dominant discourse to reading and unmasking that it's, it's supposed, supposed universal assumptions in three, the debasing of the letter, the, the debasing of the letter from the intercultural perspective of local imperialized subject. I don't want to take too much time. Um, uh, I just will go over, uh, let me read a little history here why this post-colonial thing, it's very important because now we have migrations into the US, not just mestizos from the, from, from the, from the Mexican Revolution, but now you have indigenous peoples, Mixtecos, uh, uh, Mayans, and other groups coming over. Uh, that's been happening. A while back, I was at a conference, in, uh, a conference on migration in Mexico City, and what was discussed there is that the people have been migrated to the U.S. have been indigenous people, and those are the ones that are sending the money and contributing uh, at least uh, one third of the uh, uh, um, uh, remesas or the money that's sent to Mexico. So this is what is being is a theory uh, being discussed at, at La Una. As a historic people linked to what is known as Aztlán or the American Southwest, Chicanos have experienced European exploration and colonization since the early 1500s. And two dates are very key to defining a dual colonial experience. 1598, the Juan Oñate colonization project sponsored by Spain's King Philip II of what is now known as New Mexico and Arizona. Since 1848, the United States conquest of Northern Mexico and its redefinition as the American Southwest with a central project of capitalist and cultural assimilation into a rising and new imperialist Anglo-American nation. Both major European colonizations led to the social historical erasure of pan and local cultural indigenous mythic worldviews. Although there was some cultural and armed resistance on the part of many native peoples of the Southwest, parenthesis, Akama, Navajo, Hopi, parenthesis, and among the numerically dominant indigenous and mestizos people, uh, parenthesis, Tlaxcaltecas, Mexicas, Tarascans, Zacatecos, mixed Indio and Espanol, uh, in parenthesis, who accompanied and served the Spanish colonialists from 1598 to 1821, and there were many instances of native people's resistance from 1848 to the 1950s, parenthesis, Apaches, Yaquis. An indigenous mythic worldview remained silent in Aslan or the Southwest until the beginning of contemporary Chicano literature in 1965. Because at one time, over, over, over three quarters of the contemporary world was directly and profoundly affected by European imperialism and colon colonialism, here I'm quoting Lamming and Tiflin. Tiflin holds that, quote, the process of artistic and literary decolonization involved a radical dismantling of European codes and a post-colonial subversion and appropriation of the dominant uh, European discourses, end of quote. Well, what I'm going to pass the rest, just to recall about the Mayans because they're here. I have a student, uh, I founded a program in, in Yucatan. I, they're taking students still from, uh, from ASU. Uh, in fact, uh, they're afraid to go to Mexico City, but they still go to Yucatan. And uh, I, I, um, I established it, I lost it to a uh, but it's still there and there's still dialogue. And then when I was in, in, uh, in Merida, I recruited a, 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 a Yucateco student, a student who's here with me and he's studying the migration of the Mayans. And that's his major, that will be his uh, doctoral uh, work, okay? And, and once again, if you go back to the Mayans, if you go to the Alamo, 
in the Alamo, those who fought, uh, most, many of the soldiers that fought in the Alamo were Mayans. Just to clarify that the Mayans are not, not, not just then, but also now. And also the first, I think the first vice governor of, of, of Yucatan, I mean of Texas, uh, was from uh, Yucatan. Okay, just to keep that in mind. And, and also as far as uh, other, other indigenous peoples, you have the uh, Mixtecos, and you have a, 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 a diary called uh, El Diario de un Mojado, and he was here, when, uh, his parents started coming here in the 1940s, and it's a migration route, and he was here in the 1980s. After that, he went, he went uh, back to Mexico, to uh, uh, Oaxaca, and then he was influenced by the, uh, uh, the Zapatista uh, uh, rebellion in the 1990s, so that, uh, that's part of the, uh, of the U.S. Okay, what I want to just go b straight to the uh, mummified deer and to end it, I'm gonna skip about uh, the heart of the earth, uh, Popopo's story. I just want to share with you that both uh, Cherry Moraga and, and Luis Valdez have roots here in uh, Arizona, okay? And so did Dalo Guerrero. <laughs> when you were listening to the Pachuco and all that language, where do you think it came? Lalo Guerrero, okay? I mean, Arizona is very powerful in Chicano culture. I just want to leave that message, okay? And of course, Luis Valdez took it to LA and then he took it to New York. It's the only uh, Chicano play in the history of the Southwest, in, in all history, that has made it to New York. And it's a play that wherever it goes, it's always shown, it always sells out. It is the, what, like he said at the time, it is the classic American play. Right? I mean, he wasn't lying. I thought at the time it was a hyperbole. No, no. It was for reals, okay? I mean, this is, this is where we're at. Okay, I'm just going to read a little piece from the uh, Mummified Deer uh, in, in my essay, and, and then I'll just slowly uh, close my presentation. Yaki and Mayan Mythology and Mummified Deer by Luis Valdez. Mummified Deer by Luis Valdez shares feminist, shares feminist vision with heart of, us, of the earth. However, as a post-colonial discursive strategy, the former play features a local cultural indigenous mythic vision, the Yaki, a native nation from Sonora in Arizona, Perhaps in an answer to the male chauvinism charge on the part of Yolanda Broilis Gonzalez uh, in her book, El Teatro Campesino, Theater in, Theater in the Chicano Movement, 1994, Luis Valdez has chosen an 84-year-old Yaqui matriarch named Mama Chu Flores as a protagonist in Mama, Mama Faidir. Hospitalized in, in her deathbed in spring 1969, she falls deeply in pain and is taken to the hospital where the doctor finds where the doctor finds out that her stomach pains are in reality a decades, decades old pregnancy and she is carrying a dead deer inside her womb. This last, this last character who also appears as a yaki deer dancer named Kaheme represents the post-colonial mythic discourse that highlights a long struggle against oppression on the part of the yakis at the hands of the Mexican dictator Porfirio Diaz and now Anglo-American society. Specifically, Mama Chu Flores experienced an invasion of, uh, uh, invasion of Yaqui lands by federal Mexican troops, the forced exile into Yucatan, parenthesis 1906-1911, in the Mexican Revolution, 1917-1929, and life in Tijuana, 1939-1950. As the owner of a boarding house, in spite of all such hardships, including a rape, Mama Chu managed amidst several major family crises that her to survive until age and keep her family united. In fact, she has two children, a 56-year-old nicknamed Profe, who is in reality a barber, and a daughter named Amida Bravo, who is a graduate student at the University of, of California in Berkeley. Luis Valdez's choice of using Mayan myths in the long poem, Pensamiento per Serpentino from 1973, stands in sharp contrast with the use of one primary yet simple myth in his 2005 play, Mummified Deer the deer dancer. That is, Valdez placed aside a pan-cultural mythic worldview and instead chose, chose a local one. In the Jaki religious and mythic beliefs, the deer dance holds a spe special place as, as, as through dance and ceremonialism, one can be transported to the spiritual realm wherever one's heart's expressions, one's inner con continence and character can be strength strengthened. Okay, that's all I want to share about this Place Mama Fadir is one of my favorite. Uh, I highly recommend it, uh, and uh, this is where I want to end. Uh, I also want to say about Luis that not only can use Calo, 
artistically and a fantastic manner, but in uh, Sevilla in Spain about uh, two years ago, I witnessed Luis Valdez give a lecture, 40 minutes, all in Spanish. Créamelo no. It's incredible. I, what? I mean, I thought he was just going to do Spanglish and do English. No, no. Puro Español. So with that, I'd like to just uh, close, and I would like uh, Luis to speak to us. I want to also give a certificate to El old Professor, El Professor Pachuco también, Manuel de Jesus Hernández. We're going to close, and before we give the time to Luis Valdez, I would like to say a few words. To talk about Luis Valdez is to talk about my own search for identity, my own mid creation written by the years of my youth, always searching, not just for who I was, but who I might become. I came to the United States of America in 1973 directly from Mexico City. By the time Suzu debuted in 1979, I was in college, already getting a degree in theater arts. And by 1981, when Luis Valdez directed the film version, I was a young man of 22 years of age, working under Jorge Huerta and William Burgess in the theater company named Teatro Meta. I still remember when Valdez was nominated for a Golden Globe, the pride all of us felt seeing a Mexican-American artist reaching that level of recognition and respect through artistic means. It meant a lot for many of us. I still remember the great impact of Valdez in my life. He represented the Chicano ideal for many of us young actors during the 1970s. The men born on June 26, 1940, the playwright, the film director, the actor, the civil rights activist, the man who is considered to be the father of Chicano theater in the United States, the man who worked with Lalo Guerrero, known as the father of Chicano music, and with Cesar Chavez, co-founder of what became the United Farm Workers, became the center of our conversations for many years ahead. Valdez became the voice of many farm workers, individuals that were oppressed by the forces of mainstream culture, as well as radicals who for some strange reason did not want the economic, social, and artistic development of our community. He was the one that helped create a Chicano theater. He showed many of us that through writing and performing, we can communicate a social message that entails the treatment of our community with dignity and respect. Perhaps without Luis Valdez, we would not have the voice we have today. The images of the Mexican-American have changed in the media and in reality. Many young individuals of Mexican descent are now professionals, doctors, lawyers, actors, painters, scientists, professors. But how can we forget El Teatro Campesino and its actos, its mitos? How can we not remember those unforgettable characters like Bernabé, El Idiota, the village fool, who wants to marry La Tierra Potre as a soldadera, foreshadowing his most powerful character, El Pachuco, Orale ese, or Soldado Raso, or the epic scope of La Carpa de los Rascuachis, following a Cantin Flashlight, the Mexican Charlie Chaplin, whose character crosses the border from Mexico into the U.S., and he suffers many indignities until his death. Valdez has described Chicano theater as the reflection of the world, a universal statement about what it is to be Chicano in the United States. On July 30, 1978, Sutsu played to sold houses for 11 months. On March 25, 1979, he became the first Chicano play to open on Broadway, and in 1991, Sutsu became a motion picture. But by the year 1987, when Valdez directed the blockbuster La Bamba, his work has penetrated mainstream America. Luis is quoted by Jorge Huerta saying of his first experience arriving at a Hollywood studio. When I drove up to the studio gate, the guard at the gate told me that the pastries were taken to a certain door. The only Mexican he ever saw deliver the pastries. Did you hear? Hijo de la Chihuahua. Did you hear what he told? 
we need to say, hijo, hijo de la chiquita. But no, Valdez not only delivered a great script with excellent actors and great directing, he delivered the entire Chicano community inside Hollywood's doors and opened the way for many future artists. He's the Pachuco Mayor. He's the father of Chicano theater. He's the individual who fought before many of us, members of the Chicano community, could even begin to imagine it was possible to make it into mainstream America. Today we can say, thank you, Luis Valdez. Señor Valdez, we were able to do it. Si pudimos, si pudimos, si pudimos. Y todavía no hemos terminado. We have not finished yet. This is why we are here tonight. Honoring this living icon, this living legend, this living myth, and I don't believe I'm exaggerating. This man knew many years ago how to use the tools of the theater to express not only himself, but the entire community, nuestra gente, la raza, or people. He was able to give us something that up to this day has not died. Damas y caballeros, it is my privilege to introduce to you the father of Chicano theater a role model for many years and for many Mexican-Americans, el doctor Don Luis Valdez. Gracias a todos. Quiero expresar uh, el agradecimiento y también pues todo el aprecio que le tengo a este a esta conferencia realmente como escritor, como chicano. I really believe that this conference is an essential conference and that you're doing a wonderful job here of bringing focus on the Chicano literature. I can't tell you how important I think that is. It's, my whole life has been about this. And it doesn't matter, you know, that there aren't thousands of people writing yet, because it's all a gradual process, you know. I want to share with you some perspectives. I feel that I've been a very fortunate human being in my life. I was born into a family of farm workers in a labor camp in Delano, California. Uh, in a little shack, my mother took me to see it before they tore down the labor camp. And she said, aquí, aquí naciste, mijo. It was a little two-room shack in Delano. And I was really surprised, you know, because it was really poor. We were poor then, but this was even poorer. <laughs> and I said, ah, perdido. You know, this is where I, I came out. Uh, but the thing is that I was very fortunate to be born poor. Uh, because it gave me a purpose in life, believe it or not. I was very fortunate to be born into my family because uh, our roots uh, go back into Sonora, como señalaste. And uh, we came to the United States. I came with them, I suppose as a gene, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I wasn't alive then. Uh, but uh, the thing, my, my dad wasn't even alive then, you know. But the thing is that uh, Porfirio Diaz decided to solve the Yaqui problem once and for all, and the Mayan problem también. I deal with these in Mummified Fetus, my play. And it was an age-old problem that had been plaguing Mexico for centuries. Mexico was obviously a colony of Spain. Its purpose was not to establish democracy and equality for all. It was to enrich the mother country. And uh, so they put a ruling class of criollos on top of this whole mass of indigenous peoples and then proceeded to supplant and suppress those indigenous cultures with heavy religious doctrination and, and physic, physical brutality so that all those indigenous became wage slaves. And it took a long time in the history of Mexico for Mexico to declare its own cry of freedom. And uh, it began, of course, in the 19th century, El Grito de Dolores with Miguel Hidalgo y Costilla, Otro Criollo, Jose Maria Morelos y Pavón, I mean, I consider that to be my history too. And you know what? It's part of American history. Because that was a cry for equality and democracy in Mexico. Now, you're, we're talking, you know, Guanajuato, we're talking Morelia, we're talking 
El, el alto plano central de México, you know, where Mexican history was created in the 19th century. But it was really a cry to try to establish the nation of Mexico. It didn't work yet in the 19th century. Benito Juarez came along and he was an accident, really. He was taught in secret by a sacerdote, a priest to read, because the society wasn't prepared to let Indians read, much less to let Indians get on top of horses. The caballeros, which is a word that means gentlemen in Mexican Spanish culture, los caballeros were the guys that were up on the horses. That's why they were caballeros, caballos horse. They were the horsemen were the gentlemen. And these were basically the Spanish, or these, the, the New World born Spanish, the criollos, who were the caballeros. Everybody else was on foot. And they were the peones. Pie is foot. Peon means to be on foot. And so they were caballeros and they were peones and that was it. And there was nothing in between. So the history of Mexico was to try to forge a nation out of this e disequality, of this inequality. And so it went from, from Hidalgo and the War of Independence against Spain, that was betrayed. Morelos got in there, he was betrayed. He was a priest who turned into a re revolutionary. And, and it went on to Benito Juarez, and, and then Benito Juarez fell, fought against the French. And then Benito Juarez's best general, Porfirio Diaz, became president of Mexico for 30 years. And he turned into a dictator. But he brought railroads and he brought factories and he brought American and British investment into Mexico and looked like Mexico began to look as if it was a, you know, a, a modern nation. But in fact it wasn't because it was built on top of the backs of all kinds of campesinos and indios that were wage slaves. And Mexico had to have its next burst of freedom, which was the revolution of 1910. And it was at that time that my family crossed from Sonora into Arizona in 1909 because Porfirio Diaz was eliminating the Yaquis and my people were Yaquis. And uh, they, they, they couldn't survive there. There was a genocidal war. What Porfirio Diaz was doing is that he was knocking out the rebels in the Yucatan, the Mayan rebels, the revolutionaries, enslaving them and sending them as slaves to Cuba and then he was killing all of the Yaqui rebels in Sonora and taking the survivors, putting them in boxcars. Boxcars. Before Hitler's final solution, Porfirio Diaz had a final solution to the Yaqui problem. And he put them in boxcars and shipped them to Mexico City where they were put on the auction block and sold for $60 a head as slaves to the Hennigan plantation. And of course the Yucatan, you know, continued to have its problems that led to the Mexican Revolution in the same way that the problems in Sonora led to the Mexican Revolution. And it was not solved. It has not been completely solved to this day. It was a, it was a violent, brutal revolution that killed a million people. You know, 10% of the, of the population of Mexico came to the United States. They emigrated. That was the revolution, that was the generation of 1916. And out of that generation were born the Chicanos. Actually, the generation of 16, those immigrants were the original Chicanos. They were farm workers. They were campesinos. These were people that did not know what the cities were about. Mexico had no cities. It had Guadalajara and it had Mexico City. Everybody else lived in ranchos. Everybody else lived in villages. They had no sense of urbanity. They had no sense of democracy, really. That was something that, that only the intellectuals and people that could read uh, had an opportunity to do that. Now, uh, I believe uh, my grandparents could read a little bit, but not much. Not much. Write a little bit, but not much. It was finally my father, who was born in Nogales in 1912. 1912. That's when Nogales was either Nogales, Mexico, or Nogales, USA. Nogales, Sonora, or Nogales, Arizona. It was at the time of the, that Arizona was still a territory. So my dad was both a Mexican and an American citizen. But uh, the family had headed north, and so they went to Tucson. And there he went to American schools. And, and my dad was bilingual. And when he was in the fifth grade, my grandfather, who had been in the mines in Cananea, developed lung disease, and he died at the age of 38. He's buried here in Mesa. They left his bones here. They, he called my dad to his deathbed, and he said, Mijo, ahora vas a ser el hombre. Now you're the man of the family. You've got to support your mother and your brothers and your sister. And my dad went to work. He never went back to school. But that hunger stayed with him. And he communicated that hunger to his kids. He bought an encyclopedia, which we used to take into the fields with us. We'd go from labor camp to labor camp. 
with his cheap Encyclopedia Britannica, and that's how we began to learn. See, that hunger, that need, fed you. And I'm saying, I've always believed you can turn any negative into a positive. So the fact that I was born poor, that I was born yucky, all of that were eventually positives for me because it really motivated my parents. They were a little bilingual, so I was even more bilingual than they were. So were my brothers and sisters. It's all gradual, you know, we, we, we've, we've got a debt of gratitude to all the people that have come before us.